Right, sorry, it's right happening now. I'm also going to just change the view so that we see speaker. Um, okay, Suzanne, um, so Suzanne Edgerton is a writer and she says if she still has a job to go back to after lockdown, she's also a fitness instructor. Her debut novel, Out Late with Friends and Regrets, was published in 2013. And her short story collection, I Really Did Love Her in 2019. Suzanne says she loves the scary presence of an audience. So that's great that you're all here so that she can uh, enjoy that scary presence. And I'm sure none of you are scary. Uh, <laughs> um, and she has read at many events, including the Edinburgh Book Festival. Um, three of her short plays have been performed by a small Glasgow company. And she's currently working on a novel on a novel. against the background of a London festival. I asked you ever to be... <laughs> That's great. Thank you. <laughs> that always... It's always good to know that we're all live because that those sort of things happen, right? That's great. Uh, thank you for, for muting. Um, so Suzanne is currently working on a novel set against the background of a London casino in 1970, and the working title of that is The Golden Chance, which she expects to complete this summer. And if you happen to find Suzanne on Facebook, she does uh, do little readings, mostly on a weekly basis, which are nice little tasters of uh, her work, and I've been really enjoying that. Okay, so Suzanne, what gave you the, what spurred you to begin writing? That's a difficult one because writers always have to write. I've always written, but uh, it only became the other job when we moved to Motherwell. And uh, that's so close to Glasgow where there's a huge, uh, a very varied and interesting literary scene with lots of reading gigs and so forth. So that's when I really got into it. Brilliant, thank you. So um, I'm going to hand over to you to, to announce what you're reading from, and you're going to do two different readings. And then we'll, we'll ask you, um, everybody is open to ask you uh, questions after the reading. And as I say, if you want to pop them into the chat box or just hang on to your questions until, until uh, Suzanne's finished. So uh, if everybody could mute while Suzanne's reading, that would be awesome. And uh, away you go, Suzanne. Thanks, Lisa. My first reading is from uh, this book here, uh, Out Late with Friends and Regrets. And uh, you remember last month how Maggie was saying what a doorstop her, her novel was at 402 pages. Well, that's uh, 411, I'm afraid. Right. The introduction to this reading. The main character, Fiona, later known as Finn, was married very young to a controlling man, and only after his death does she realize at the advanced age of 38 that she's gay. Because she's been isolated from friends and family over the years, she lacks social skills, but she manages to make contact with a university lecturer called Ellie, who will later become her mentor and friend. They've arranged to meet at a nightclub. The story is more about late development and the difficulties and misadventures of growing into a whole new life rather than about just being gay. It was never meant to be lesbian fiction as such, and luckily it's always had crossover appeal, as I intended. So this is Fiona just arriving at the nightclub. She watched two women effusively greeting one another in the far corner and wondered if they were straight or gay. The willowy brunette stood over six feet tall in her stilettos, wearing a tight purple evening dress, her face immaculately made up to a doll-like prettiness. The other was honey-skinned, clearly had some Afro-Caribbean ancestry. Her close-cropped hair was dyed an unfeasible golden yellow, and huge earring hoops jiggled as she laughed. Her lipstick was a sparkling metallic scarlet. No, these two couldn't be lesbian girly by half. Brunette, the brunette suddenly gazed upwards and clasped her hand to her chest in a dramatic gesture. Fiona smiled, noticing the Adam's apple in the profile. She glanced at her watch, 20 to 9. What now? 
She scanned the place looking for someone who might be on. What would she be like? The voice on the phone was very posh. Taking a deep breath, her second drink in hand, she decided to move through the melee and make a circuit. It would feel less awkward than sitting and waiting. She shuffled slowly through the throng, glancing at each table, a half smile on her face in readiness. Of course, Ellie might not come. Or she may have been held up. She sounded a very busy character. What if there'd been an accident on the way? Oh, shut up, Fiona, she thought. Just go round for once and then sit down and wait. Plenty to look at, after all. From behind, a hand landed on her shoulder and squeezed it. Fiona! exclaimed Annie's voice. About 50 bees worth of famous grouse slopped over the rim of the glass as Fiona jumped in surprise. Turning, she found herself looking into a pair of expressly dark eyes and a dazzling smile. The shock was profound. It was the golden woman with the yellow hair. Oh, hi, Abby, she said, trying not to look as thrown as she felt. In fact, it was hard not to smile back in the face of that high voltage grin. She added quickly, hey, you are good. What if it hadn't been me? I would have apologized charmingly and chatted you up, of course, replied Ellie. No, I was pretty certain you were Fiona. Body language, you know. Hey, you look absolutely great, by the way. Now I'd like you to meet my friend Desiree. Desiree, this is Fiona. Fiona put her hand out to shake, but Desiree, the brunette in the purple gown, embraced her and kissed the air by the side of her head. Well. Hello, Fiona, said Desiree in a breathy tenor voice. So how long has this been going on, huh? You cheeky baggage, said Ellie. We've only just met, as well as you know. A beautiful friendship, potentially, if you don't box it up before it starts. Desiree slipped an arm round Fiona's waist and drew her close. You listen to your auntie, Helen, said Desiree. You need to know that this is an awful naughty lady you're getting yourself involved with. She already went and broke more hearts than Jinky Johnson's school record. And it's my opinion, by the way, that you're way too good for half done, that's the truth. Fiona laughed as Ellie counted. God, Desiree, you old tart. I was going to invite you to have a drink with us, but now you can just bother off. Such a, such a lady sighed the zero, rolling her eyes. The way Brandy would be fine, thank you, dear. Amused as he was, Fiona was a little concerned that the evening might turn into a fascinating but generally counterproductive threesome, but Desiree glanced at her watch and exclaimed, Oh my God, wait a fucking game, pardon my French ladies, but I need to go. See you later. And she was gone. At this point, the girls sit down and have a meal in one class, which I like to admit. Both women were now experiencing that delightful sense of reduced responsibility that follows Pixie that precedes Blasted. And when Ellie took Finn's hand and suggested they go down to the disco, it seemed like a really good idea. Desiree was playing delightful old cheesy pops in between newer indie and club tracks. Suzanne, hold on a second. You've been you've muted for some reason. Uh, I, I'm going to just try and do that from my end. Right, I've unmuted. Okay, that's great. Sorry about that. So if you could just go back, maybe a couple of sentences. <clears throat> Don't know what happened there. Sorry. Okay, uh, they've just gone down to the the disco, and uh, there's. Uh, Desiree DJing, and now she's just handed out the uh, karaoke book. The coloured splinters and spots of light stroking the darkness in great sweeps were just beginning to make Finn's eyes twitch when Desiree announced, Okay, folks, it's karaoke time. We're kicking us off to delectable beavers you're just gonna love. We are in 
sisters are doing it for themselves. And if that was your girls, you are dirty with things. Please put your hands together for the newsome twosome, Ellie and Finn. Yeah! They stumbled towards the dais, laughing and cursing as the applause and catcalls rolled around them and took the twin mics. It was Finn's first karaoke, and she stood grinning in the shifting mass, wondering when to start, until Ellie took hold of her shoulders and turned her round bodily to see the screen. Finn could hold a tune, but found even a familiar number could have tricky bits that memory failed to anticipate. However, her smaller inaccuracies were overcome by sheer, uninhibited enthusiasm, not unconnected with alcohol intake, and were in any case drowned out by Ellie's impassioned but tuneless bellow. They left the stage clutching each other and almost incontinent with laughter and with the audience roaring approval. If ever a night should last forever, thought Finn, with a few unaffected brain cells still functioning, this was it. Right, that's, that's the first reading. I'm just going to have a quick slug. Uh, this is a shorter one you'll be glad to hear. Suzanne, that was amazing. Thank you. I think everybody's giving you a sort of silent round of applause on their, on their screens. Thank you so much. This one's quicker. It's from... Uh, oh, sorry. This one's uh, from my short story collection called I Really Did Love Her. The tone and content of the various stories varies enormously. There are some amusing ones. And there are some quite uh, quite other ones, and uh, one or two which are a little bit surreal. So it's a mixed bag, that one. This is an extract from one of the more popular ones, probably because uh, people laugh at it. It's uh, the story is called No Lady, and uh, the narrator is Linda. She's on a cruise after being dumped by her girlfriend. She's hoping to be miserable in peace but this peculiar old woman seems determined to keep her company hello linda dear this is a nice place isn't it oh uh, hello hetty i said as neutrally as possible hopefully disguising the sinking feeling i hate to see anybody sitting on their own loneliness is a terrible thing isn't it she said before I could think of an appropriate reply, she added, Would you like one of those big cream cakes, Linda? Let me treat you. And she scuttled to the counter and returned with a tea for herself and two giant, gaudy creations flourished with squirty cream. I thanked her and bit into the dodgy looking cake. It was a lot less nasty than I expected. The sponge was light and the cream real. That's really nice, Hetty, I said. I must have sounded surprised because she displayed the full set of lashes in a big grin and the gingery curls framing her face quivered. Ah, oh, well, she had bought me with cake, so I would need to be pleasant. Are you enjoying the cruise? I said. I love my cruises, dear, she replied. I always enjoy them. Better than sitting at home with no one to talk to. She fell silent for a moment. Then she said, You're a gay girl, aren't you, Linda? A leather? I must admit, I was a bit taken aback. Um, yes, Hetty, I said. How did you know? Well, when I first spotted you, I didn't think you were. I just thought you might be a librarian with your serious look and the way you dress. But seeing you talk to those girlies yesterday and, well, believe it or not, I used to be in the theatre. And my dear, it was full of queer people. Nancy boys and Spanish girls, you know. Not to mention folk who didn't mind either way. Stuffed with them it was. So I know the look. Oh, Gada, I said. Oh, yes, she said. I can spot them all right. Trusted old theatrical. She sat back and crossed her legs and posed with her chin turned to one shoulder. Did you enjoy acting? I asked. 
She clasped her hands together and squeezed her eyes shut. It was marvellous, she said. I miss it every single day. And for a moment, I thought she might be going to cry. But it was love. Love took me away. Dear Alphonse, I would have done anything for him. In fact, I did. I had his child. He was married, of course, the naughty thing. But I forgave him because when his wife ran off and divorced him, he married me and we had a wonderful life together. But naturally, I had to give up the theatre. That's some story, I said. And did you have more children and grandchildren? My little boy was born dead, she said. I couldn't have any more. But that's life for you, isn't it, dear? I'm so sorry. I said, feeling bad about my former disdain. And have you got a nice friend, Linda? She said, quickly adding, probably not on your own and on a cruise. But don't worry, a lovely girl like you, you won't be alone for long. I'm not looking, I said. I need to get over the last one. And she nodded. Just then, crew member Dee Dee, neatly chignoned and uniformed, approached. Hetty whispered, have you taken a fancy to her, Linda? I think she likes you. And now I knew the meaning of the term theatrical whisper. Dee Dee could not have failed to hear. Oh, right. so what? I agreed to meet Hetty later for a salsa class, and we shuffled and wiggled for an hour. To no great artistic effect, but she enjoyed it. We shared a pot of tea in the binnacle bar afterwards, to the evident amusement of manageress Chris, who was again on duty. She's lovely, said Hetty in her whisper. I think she's more your type, Linda. Why don't you ask her if she's free? No, Hetty, I said. I need time. Don't take too long, dear, she said. Blink twice and you'll find it too, it's too late. You're old and nobody wants you. You don't seem to have given up, I said. She looked down into her cup of tea. Just acting, dear, she said. I like to pretend. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Suzanne. That was absolutely amazing. I, um, the voices, the way you change between the, the characters, that's such a, a gift. It, um, it was so rich to, to listen to. Thank you very much. So open to audience now to ask Suzanne um, anything, comment or ask her any questions. So go ahead. Maybe um, what we'll do is a hand raise just so that we know that somebody's about to speak and then we won't have the, the awkwardness of two people speaking at once. So open forum. <laughs> this is normally what happens. <laughs> Total silence. Oh, I, think, I, I think there's a hand up there, Suzanne yeah. Lee's number one fan. <laughs> Can I just pick up on what you just said a minute ago, Lisa? Um, this perhaps won't mean a great deal to some of you in the room, I'm not sure. But Suzanne, it, while you were reading, especially that second story, particularly when you got to the bit about um, Leza or Librarian, that line, I, I didn't have time to write down the exact line, but where we all sort of laughed. Do you remember 2015, actually I think I asked you in 2014, 2015, end of January, I had asked you to take part in an event to celebrate another writer who had, who had lost in the previous December, Barbara Hammond. Yes. And I was sitting listening to you and watching you right now and just thinking, and I don't think you ever met Barbara. I think you said that to me at the time, but there was something about how you read that made me believe you were absolutely one of the right people to have there that day. And right now it's honestly, after all these years, it's just clicked. What you do is that you absolutely lift the characters miles away from simply being words on a page and you breathe life into them and you make them real mm. and do you know what I mean it's I can't explain it really any better than that but 
when you speak, and I, I felt this the first time I ever heard you read anything at, at the, you know, the cafe on Moor all those years ago, I, 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 it was like I knew the people you're talking about. I was there, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I jokingly put on my wee name thing today, Suzanne E's number one fan. But I did that before the moment clicked that I've just tried to describe. So there you go, you know. Um, it, it might sound a bit sort of sycophantic, but mm, not really my way in life. I just say what I think, and, and that's absolutely what I think. Your words are a gift to, to everyone that comes in contact with them, but it's not just the words, it's your ability to breathe the life into them and make us see the characters and believe in them and feel for them and, and feel as if we know them. And I think that's amazing. Oh, shut up now. There you go. Well done, you. <laughs> I'll expect a check in the post. <laughs> <laughs> Just got, I've just got a royalty payment from, oh. uh, from the publisher, £3.98. <laughs> You're feeling very blessed, I can tell, Suzanne, very blessed indeed. <laughs> uh, there was the moment that you read, um, and when you said the baby died or the baby was born dead, I, I'm glad we were all on mute because I think there would have been a huge collective gasp in the room because... The way you the way you said that, the way you read it, um, it was so moving because we'd gone from laughter, and suddenly there was this real moment of poignancy. And I, I, I think the gift of delivery. I mean, it's it was it was amazing. But I mean, I love I loved the story um, as well. But just ha hearing you read it was such a privilege. Thank you so much. Does anybody have anything they'd like to ask Suzanne? Yeah. Can I ask something? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm an artist, and definitely the second uh, story, No Lady. I've seen that as a, a really visual, like your voices on that. You know, they they were it was pretty impressive, um, and I saw it like a sort of um, an illustration or like a short animation of you know the two women talking, and I kind of like a like a clatter clatter behind when they were having the conversation, and like you know. You know, like when she said about the, the the stillbirth and how everything would just go quiet and then continue the kind of, yeah, it, I didn't expect that when you were reading it. So it was a quite a, a kind of shocking point, but it, it it fitted absolutely beautifully in the story. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it just reminded my friend, Martha has just recently come out and she told me that when she told her mother, her mother said to her, well, that describes why you dress so badly and why you're always in such a bad mood. <laughs> this was her mother. <laughs> so I'm sure. Um, I'm sure I'm gonna um, mention to her about your book. I think she would actually get a lot from it. Where can we find your books, Suzanne? Right, out, out late with friends and regrets is available ebook or sold by the pound um, on Amazon. Um, this one, the story, uh, the book of stories, it's available as an ebook online, but the hard copy, the paperback, um, because of publishing difficulties, I can only sell it direct and uh, I charge people in the UK £10, including postage, but obviously overseas readers, uh, I'd need to add a little bit on for extra postage, but £10 covers the book and it's quite a slim volume, so it's not all that much of a bargain, I know, but that includes postage, which is, is about four quid or something like that, so I suppose it's a bit of a bargain. Thank you. Uh, Philip, does that uh, answer your question? Philip sent, what's the name of the story collection? So, I It's think... called I Really Did Love Her. Thank you. And uh, if, um, I don't know if it's going to be, uh, if I'm taking up too much time, I see it's just 16.30. You're fine, you're fine, Suzanne. You're absolutely fine, yeah. yeah. Right. Thank okay. you. I'll just read the blurb very quickly. 
Scottish-based writer Suzanne Edgerton has put together an assortment of stories and short pieces which explore the female experience, often in unexpected ways. Once again, it's not just a lesbian book. There are lesbians in it, but there are also feminists, and there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of other interesting characters, including a, a trans person in one of the stories. From a young woman's concern for her husband's mistress to the to the trans man haunted by a long ago rape, from the debut lesbian author stranded in a hotel of ill repute, there is a story for that one, uh, to the unexpected benefits of a sex chat line, there is lust, love, lost love, and plenty more. And who would think to wonder, earrings or not, is God really gender neutral? <laughs> Great, thank you. It's a question I've often asked. <laughs> okay, does anybody else have anything they want to ask Suzanne or comment or anything? Could, could, could I make a random, um, or make a random, just voice a random thought for Suzanne? Yeah. Um, just based on what we were saying earlier, and, and um, oh, I've lost you. Sleepy Labif, um, that's an interesting name. You made a similar comment, obviously, about how visual it all was. Uh, Suzanne, you may or may not be interested to know that uh, PBH Free Fringe, who are the group who probably put on most of the Fringe Festival shows each year in Edinburgh, are looking to hopefully do some, obviously, live Fringe events, but they're also looking for people who are interested in doing virtual Fringe events with with how visual your stories are and how um, how performance without being lovey performance your reading is, that might be something you would be interested in or anybody else who feels that's up their avenue. Uh, but they're, they're, they're looking for people to express interest right now. PBH, Free Fringe, again, I'll shut up now. Um, uh, do you want to pop that in the chat box, Ian? That might be yeah, helpful. Yes, and, then, and then, you know, if you see it in the chat box, you can cut and paste it. Um, that would be really helpful. Thank you for that information. That's great. Right. We're going to move on to our second fabulous author of this afternoon. Uh, so Mary Turner Thompson. Um, very, very um, awesome person. I will say, I'll just <laughs> confess help here. Oh, you um, can Mary, come again. <laughs> <laughs> Mary and I have another working relationship. She's uh, the, the editor of all of my work. And um, uh, yeah, so I, I love working with Mary. It's a mutual fandom. <laughs> <laughs> so Mary's done many things in her life. Uh, she's worked as an actress. Uh, she's worked as an AFM in the BBC studios and a producer in corporate television. Mary retrained in marketing in the 1990s and has run her own business as well. She was working as a business development advisor for the Scottish Enterprise Network in 2006, when she discovered that her husband and father of her two younger children was not only a bigamist, but a psychopath con man who actively impregnates women to rip them off for money. What a charmer, what a charmer. Lovely guy. <laughs> Instead of letting the situation destroy her, she wrote a book about her experience titled The Bigamist. Fifteen years on, and her second book about the subject was launched on 1st of March in 2021, which is called The Psychopath, and it details the full recovery that she um, went through and her research into psychoth psychothopy, as well as what particular psychopath did after leaving jail. So welcome, Mary. Thank you for being available this afternoon. It's absolutely very fabulous welcome. to have you. Um, I'm delighted to be here. So that, you know, you sort of said you, you didn't, you decided I'm not going to let this destroy me. I'm going to write about it. Exactly. What was that moment? What was it like a, you know, road to Damascus moment or, or what was that <laughs> moment? Uh, well, actually, I'm, I'm part of the reading I'm going to do is actually covers that. So uh, I'll, I'll sort of not go into detail, but um, I think when I was a kid, if if somebody said to me, oh, what would you like to be when you're grown up? You know, do you want to be a movie star? Would you like to be a pop star? You know, I would have said author. You know, I've always been in awe of authors. Um, and, you know, sort of like I, I just never, ever, ever thought it would actually happen. So when when this all happened to me, I thought, 
you know what? This is the most incredible story I've ever come across in my life. You know, if, if, if this isn't a subject of a book, I don't know what is. So yeah, that, that's, that, that was the sort of origins of it. Brilliant, thank you. Well, I'll, let, I'll ask everybody to get on mute and we'll hand the platform over to Mary to read from her work. And then at the end of Mary's reading, we will have opportunity to ask questions. And again, if you want to put them in the chat box before that, that's great. Thank you, Mary, over to you. If I'm just trying to get my wires out of the way so I don't <laughs> bash the, I've got a microphone on a boom. So if I bash it, it makes a really loud noise. So try not to do that. So I'm going to do two readings, um, one from each book. So uh, the first, the first one is The Bigamist. Um, and I'm going to read the, the very start of it. So you get an idea of where this comes from. So The Bigamist. <clears throat> 5th of April, 2006. It was a Wednesday morning, a damp grey April day, and my three young children were starting to play up. They needed to get out of the house, so I decided on a trip to the library to get some fresh air and some new picture books to entertain them. While trying to get them ready, one shoe remained elusive and I was spending more time looking for it than should have been necessary. I was grateful for the distraction, however, and was keeping myself actors active as it meant I didn't have to think about everything else that was going on. The phone rang and I answered with a quick, distracted, hello? Are you Mary Turner Thompson? asked a woman's voice. Yes, I replied with some trepidation. I was dreading a phone call from my husband's female lawyer that would tell me how his court case had gone that morning. If it was her voice on the other end of the line, it meant he was in jail having been found guilty of trumped up charges of bigamy, fraud, firearms offences and not regi registering his address under the Sexual Offences Act. I knew none of it was true. Will had explained everything to me. I had known for some time now that he was a CIA agent and that the problems had arisen when he tried to get out of the service. He'd been set up. The marriage certificate the police were using as evidence against him was part of a cover story set up by his employers to explain his presence in the country. The firearms charges and failure to register as a sex offender were also related to his work, and the fraud charges had arisen due to a misunderstanding. Will had warned me that powerful forces were working against him, and he expected to receive a short jail sentence. But he assured me that once he was out, it would all be over. He would be free and we could be together, finally, as a family. The call snapped me back to the nightmare, but I could not have imagined what was going Sorry, to come next. I'm not sure. Echo, be quiet. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I didn't even say her name. Uh, uh, da, da, da. This, the call snapped me back to the nightmare, but I could not have imagined what was going to come next. Are you Mrs. Jordan? The voice asked. Yes, I said, again, now feeling a building knot of anxiety. I am the other Mrs. Jordan, she said. And without pause and before I could react in any way, delivered the second punch. Have you been told I'm an agent? Stunned and still reeling, I automatically replied, yes. I was told you were an agent, she said. The blood ran hot through my veins, flooding my whole body with warmth. It rushed to my brain and I felt myself, start, my, felt myself start to shake. I've never experienced a reaction like it, and it was totally physical, not emotional. I had no emotion at that moment in time. I was numb in the truest sense of the word. Nothing I had ever felt was real. Nothing I knew was real. Everything was gone. The facade of my life crumbled around me. I knew she was telling the truth. I had probably known for some time, but had just refused to believe it, refused to give up on hope and accept that my bizarre life was a sham. Now hope was gone, there was nothing left, and deep down, I had known all along it was coming. For more than an hour, I listened to Michelle as she pulled my life apart with her truth. She calmly told me that she and my husband, Will Jordan, the father of my two younger children, had been married for 14 years and had five children together. He'd had numerous affairs and had fathered two children with Michelle's nanny. In fact, as she talked and I realised, all three of us, Michelle, her nanny and I, had four-year-olds with the same father. It was more than likely we had all been pregnant at the same time. In fact, they had both been pregnant when Will first contacted me. 
Michelle sounded as though she was forcing herself to remain calm, but I could hear the anger in her voice. She told me she had believed that Bill, as she called him, was an MOD intelligence officer and that the number she had rung me on was an MOD emergency line that she had been told by him never to use. She had decided that something was not right and called anyway. She had broken the rules of her training, something I had never done. There was a note of desperation in her voice, as if she needed to learn as much as possible before discovery. I was in shock. So when Michelle asked if she could visit me, I automatically said yes and gave her my address. I wonder now if I did not think at all, but in fact, I could not think. I had been transported away from my reality. The world I had lived in had not ex did not exist, and I was left in limbo, unaware of anything other than all had gone. Without thinking about the possible implications or consequences, I just accepted and meekly allowed the world to disintegrate around me. Michelle gave me specific instructions. Tell no one. No one, she emphasised, and hung up to drive to Edinburgh. Once again, someone was telling me to stay silent. But this time, I would not do as I was told. I called a friend, a good friend, who had stood by me, and I asked for help for the first time. She instantly dropped what she was doing and came to me, and I had told her everything. I told her the whole story from the very beginning. So that's the first, the first bit of the, the, the bigger mist. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really weird reading that because I wrote that in 2007. So <laughs> it's been a while since I read it. So that's fine. Um, and that, that book came out in 2007 um, and has been out since then, still selling, doing well, which is very nice. This, this book here, is the new one that's just come out called The Psychopath. And I want to review again the beginning of this because you can see, see the difference in, in where I was then and where I am now. So. Thank you, Mary. Okay, so the second reading is this. So it carries on from exactly the same point in fact. So I thought that would be a nice way to do it. I was numb. I hovered on the carved carnage of my life. Sorry, I will start again. I was numb. I hovered in the carnage that was my life like a movie scene from an aftermath of a bomb attack. Ears ringing and deaf to the chaos around me as everything exploded outwards. My external world shattered as my mind inside crumbled. At that moment, I could not imagine how anything would ever be all right again. The devastation was all consuming and left me wondering how it would ever be possible to recover at all. But recover. I have. In 2006, I lost everything from the life that I knew. It had all been taken from me by the man that I'd fallen in love with in 2000 and married, bigamously as it turned out, in 2002. My savings and everything I'd built up financially as an adult disappeared. Work was gone and with it my ability to earn money. My home was taken away, leaving my children and me to the mercy and whims of a landlord. The debts incurred in my name were astronomical. The man who I had pledged to have and to hold had turned out to be a monster who not only impregnated women to rip them off for money, but psychologically tortured and abused women all his life, mentally, emotionally and financially crippling them just for his own amusement. This man who had professed to be my soulmate and had got into my head and systematically and changed my thinking, making me live in fear and robbing me of the powers of expression, keeping me silent so I couldn't articulate what was happening to me. He made me love him whilst he was abusing me. I had given everything to this man, my body, my heart, my money, my voice and my mind, but I had been sleeping with the enemy. I had been fooled, manipulated, conned, abused, emotionally crumpled up like a piece of rubbish and discarded. My self-confidence and my self-esteem were shattered. I kept asking myself, how could I have been so completely taken in by this cons consummate liar? and it threatened to silence me all over again, because I knew others were asking the same question. How could I have been so stupid, desperate, needy, or naive? However, the more important question was, where do I go from here? I still had something to help me hold it all together though. My children, Robin, Ailey, and Zach, no matter what happened, I still had them, and I owed it to them to find a way out of the quagmire. Spoiler alert. I not only moved forward, but I found my voice and used it to climb out of the pit and up a mountain. 
I not only made it back, I created a new and more vibrant life for myself and my family. When I finished writing The Bigamist, I was still breathing. I was surviving after my traumatic experience. Now, as I finish writing The Psychopath, I feel lucky and grateful to be where I am. Not grateful to my abuser, but thankful to have had the opportunity to test my mettle and to use my experiences to help others. I've not only recovered, I've become immune to toxic personalities and now use my knowledge to show people who are in a similar situation how to escape, survive and thrive through my writing and speaking. This book is about my journey to the top of that seemingly overwhelmingly high mountain and proof that recovery from a psychopath is possible. It's also, also the story of what the psychopath did next. My life changed forever on the 5th of April 2006 when I answered the phone and the woman on the other end introduced herself as my husband's other wife. Suddenly the walls of my terrifying world crumbled around me and I was free from the abuse and control that I wasn't even aware had trapped me. I look back on that moment now with even more clarity as time gives me wisdom to see what was really happening. For a while in 2006 I seemed to be living my life in a vacuum. I functioned, and as the days turned into weeks, I gradually stopped having to remind myself to breathe in and out. But I could still only focus on one thing at a time. I would take my children to school, and I got my son a free nursery place for a few hours a day. When he was there, I would go and see my mother and busy myself helping her. I concentrated on each task in turn because it stopped me from thinking about what I had just come through and the wider situation I was in. I got a lot of support from the health visitor who had recommended the nursery place, as well as pointing me in the direction of other organisations who could help. When Will Jordan, who was still my husband at that stage, was first taken to court for a preliminary hearing in April 2006, there was a lot of media attention. The crime of bigamy is quite rare in itself, and the addition of fraud, firearms offences and failure to register under the Sexual Offences Act made it a particularly juicy story for the press. Everywhere I went, I took the newspaper articles with me because I was convinced people would, wouldn't believe me when I told them what had happened. I was surprised when people just automatically assumed I was telling the truth and didn't immediately ask to see the evidence. I put a brave face on things and told everyone I was fine. But really, I was in a perpetual state of limbo, shuttling between shock and panic. I held my children close and talked to them gently. My four-year-old daughter Ailey used to sit on my lap and cry her heart out, and I cried with her as I rocked her and we grieved the loss of our family unit together. Robin, my seven-year-old, was less demonstrative and pushed her emotions down. She would cuddle me and she talked openly about it, but didn't cry as much. My son, who was only a year old, didn't know what was going on. It was all I could do to try and keep life as normal as I could for them. I couldn't work though. I couldn't focus on anything else other than putting one foot in front of the other. I had to register for benefits to survive financially. I was signed off on state-funded incapacity benefit or sick pay, which is usually reviewed on a regular basis to ensure you're not scamming the system. That's what happens when you close the door and the cat wants out. So, um, da, 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 da. Um, Close the door on the system with your. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was called to a medical review after a couple of months, and as usual, I took the articles with me. I went into the doctor's office and showed them to her. She commented that I was holding it together very well and signed me off indefinitely. I'm still very grateful for that, particularly in the first year when I had nothing and had hit rock bottom. Once I found my voice and started to talk to people, I found that I couldn't stop. I had to keep silent. I had, I had been kept silent long enough and I felt compelled to tell people about it. I told everyone I spoke to about what had happened. Not in intricate detail, but I would spill out the gist before I even knew I was talking about it again. My friends were very patient with me, but I knew that eventually it would start to grate and tried hard to stop talking to them about it. When I started to tell, then I started to tell strangers instead, anyone that I hadn't already banged onto about the subject. It got so I had to consciously stop myself from talking. I would be standing at a bus stop and someone would say, good morning to me, something that's still quite common in Scotland. I would smile and reply, good morning, and then add, I've just found out my husband is a bigamist and a con man. It was almost like I was rebelling against the years of silence and having been told I couldn't tell anyone anything at all. Sometimes they would react with shock and avoid any further conversation, but sometimes they were fascinated and engaged, which helped me gradually make sense of what had happened. I also had a compulsion to find out more, to talk to other victims of Will Jordan and understand the bigger picture. 
I was in regular contact with Alice Keane, the woman who had, had been his employee, who had been engaged to him and defrauded by him. He had used her credit card to pay for repairs for his car and she had set up a police sting to catch him. Between us, we found George, Will Jordan's son in the USA, who introduced me to his mother, Devi, who had been Will, Will Jordan's childhood sweetheart when he was 15 and she was 14 years old. My husband's other wife in the UK had told me about Will Jordan's first wife in the USA, Alexis, and it was not too difficult to track her down. Alexis had married Will Jordan when he was 23 years old and had defrauded her of money as well as cheated on her with both Devi and the woman who was later to become his wife in the UK. I requested itemised phone bills and went through the numbers. There I found businesses that Will Jordan had defrauded, including a man called Malcolm who told me he had been conned too. Malcolm also told me about the numerous other business people he had been in contact with when he'd investigated Will Jordan himself. Each of the victims I tracked down and talked to added to the picture and it became clearer that this was a lifelong pattern of behaviour. The more people I talked to, the more victims I found. The bigger picture was huge. In the summer of 2006, I wanted to read about how other people had dealt with the similar situations. So at some point I walked into a bookshop and asked for a book about bigamy or being conned by a lover, telling the assistant briefly about what had happened to me. He shrugged, looking astonished and said, he didn't know of anything like that. I've been an avid reader since my early 20s and usually read novels, but I found after April 2006 that I couldn't read anything except true crime. For nearly a year, I read only stories about domestic violence, child abuse and tales of survival in traumatic situations. I had admired Alice Seaball's novel, The Lovely Bones, in 2004. I came across her memoir, Lucky, which is the story of her own horrific rape and how she recovered from it. More than that, it is how her rape affected everyone around her, and I could see where the story of the lovely bones had come from. Something she said really resonated with me though. She talked about PTSD and how she had surrounded herself with violence to make her own past feel more normal. I realized that I was surrounding myself with horrific stories of abuse, manipulation and coercive control too. It helped normalize my own situation and make me feel less alone. However, there was nothing out there that truly matched what I had been through. Surely I was not the only one. My mother had helped me hold my head above water with her sympathetic, matter-of-fact, calm strength, even after finding out that she was losing her battle with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, just weeks after discovering my husband was a bigamist. She was there for me. She was amazingly supportive throughout the last four months, helping me recover whilst I helped her with shopping and cooking, etc. I spent as much time as possible while she fought her cancer. She told me to stand tall and to write my story down. She knew my experience would help other people and that telling it would help me. She told me there must be others, others who had been through similar situations, but if people weren't talking about it, then maybe I should. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. I, um, wow. Yeah, Thanks. wow. <laughs> Sorry about the dog and the cat. They were fine. <laughs> Throughout Suzanne's reading, but as soon as I started, they started walking around behind me asking to go out the door. Oh, honestly, so I apologize. <laughs> it's the trouble with <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the trouble with wooden floors and a dog with long nails. It's like, <laughs> and, and my thingy going off. Yes. <laughs> and you hadn't even said her name, as you say. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't say anything. Oh, no. Just she randomly does that. Hello. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, they're always they're always listening, always tuned in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> scary, so, huh? Yeah, we have a question. Um, mm -hmm. It says, wow, that sounds like an incredible story. As they say, truth is stranger than fiction. I love a good true tale. That must have been such a difficult journey to recover from. Was writing it difficult or therapeutic? Oh, definitely therapeutic. Um, there's actually, there's that, the, I, I talk a lot about the writing of the of the bigamist and the psychopath and it was the the harry potter's uh dumbledore's Ponceve, where he takes the thoughts out of his head and puts them in a bowl it's very much like that i mean what she's really talking about is writing something down and you can when you talk about a trauma or a problem you talk you can say the same thing over and over again you know, it, it, it doesn't stop you if you've already said it before. When you write something down, you don't ever write and write and write the same thing. You always have to find something new. So when you're writing it down, it's like you're pulling this, this spaghetti of 
of you know it was it's like a ball of spaghetti in your head and when you sort of pull it out you could you know you free it up for for to see where the end of the next bit of spaghetti is that's a <laughs> that analogy didn't quite work but you know it's actually it's so therapeutic it's so incredibly cathartic writing something down and you know by the time I'd finished it I didn't have to then think or worry about what had happened because I have it physically outside my head mm -hmm. so if I ever want to go back and revisit the story I can because I can just look at the book I don't have to subconsciously hold on to it mm -hmm. so absolutely you know even if you never publish it if you you know if you have any kind of trauma I would write it down because it is an incredibly cathartic thing to do thank you Mary uh, I'm not sure who asked that question it, it sort of just came up on, anonymously on the chat does anybody else have a question for, for Mary or a comment Mary how have... did it, how did it affect your children the books what do they think about the books has it helped them yeah, the the um, <laughs> so like in when I first brought out the bigamist, uh, when it was first brought out, it was Random House who published it. Um, the I used the children's middle names because I didn't know whether they were too young to make a decision for themselves, and I didn't know whether they wanted to be identified through the book. So. Um, I actually sort of like when I when I was republishing as they grew up they were very cross with me for doing that um, and they insisted that when they had a new version came out that their real names were used mm. um, and they love it they I mean it's like my <laughs> one of my kids actually went to World Book Day at primary school dressed as herself uh, and when they, when they said well hang on a minute you're not going in costume she said yes I am and held up the big of <laughs> You said I'm supposed to come as my favourite character from a book. That's me. <laughs> oh dear. So that was brilliant. But yeah, the, the the lovely thing is because I talked to them, because I told them the truth from the very beginning, they grew up knowing and understanding about the whole story. They could stand on stage and talk about psychopaths now. Um, you know, so they're they're they don't have any issues when it comes to you know daddy issues or anything else because they they completely understand and they get it and i did explain to them i mean the way i explained it to them was i said if your father was blind you wouldn't blame yourself that he can't see you um and you know he doesn't have the capacity to love people that is that is the definition of a psychopath they don't have that capacity it's they don't have the chemical connections in their brain so it's not your fault that he doesn't love you he doesn't he just isn't able to um and you know that they, they get that they understand it and they were able to ask questions as they were growing up when they were and i if they were able to phrase a question about it they were old enough to know the answer to the question mm -hmm. so i just talked to them and told them everything as they were growing up and you know it it just that that it, that whole thing about having been kept silent you know it's opening the conversation up and allowing them to talk about it you know was actually the best policy and I'm glad I did it so thanks Mary uh, somebody else wanted to ask a question and we've had another question come in through chat as well mm. um was somebody was Molly did you was it you that was going to ask a question no okay I'll read the one out from chat it's um I wonder if you consider running workshops to help others overcome a crisis by writing their story down and I think you do do that yeah don't you? yeah yeah I do that I, I do do that um I I toyed with the idea of starting a. Um, I've got, <laughs> I've got a Facebook group of his victims. Um, so we have a Facebook group that actually, but it's literally only his victims. There's enough of us that we've actually got a Facebook group of them. Um, but I have been asked numerous times if I will start a group of of general victims because I get I get letters. <sighs> when the bigamist was out, it was about two to three times a week. It's now three to five times a day. I'm getting letters from people who have been through something similar. So there clearly is a very, very big demand. Uh, and there's a big sort of cache of people out there who do want help. So absolutely. Um, you know, sort of like I'm, I'm working on the idea of, of doing workshops and having a Facebook group and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But at the moment, I'm just trying to help people individually. If they write to me, I write, I write back and try and give them some layman's advice. And <laughs> um, Jane, you wanted to speak, I think, to Mary. I did. This is quite nerve wracking for me, but I just wanted to say to Mary, thank you so much. Um, oh. You've made such a difference to me. I went through this a year and a half ago uh -huh. um, and didn't know until the police knocked on the door that he was married to somebody else. And I found your book. I don't even know how I found your book. It popped up on my Amazon thing last year. Uh -huh. um, bought it, couldn't read it, picked it up, kept putting it down, kept thinking I can't pick it up, can't read it. And it's just made such a difference to me. Massive difference. I think your case was mentioned 
in my case because there was only one other they could find of and I think it was yours oh wow because they said it was all for financial gain and it was on a bigger scale than mine yeah and and I finished the psychopath today and I have to say I'm I'm going to keep that one because and definitely reread it <laughs> if I'm ever brave enough to go back out there again just to be able to go hang on a minute now is that word salad or is it just normal <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's one thing's in the psychopath I, I go through the techniques they use mm. um and uh and also we we managed to get uh, we managed to to highlight um we managed to catch will jordan on hidden cameras so i can actually analyze yeah. his language patterns within the psychopath so it's a lot of um hints and tips on how not to get caught again yeah it was brilliant um, i really enjoyed it thank you i have to say uh, that that's that's amazing to to me it makes it means the world to me that my book actually affects other people and it, it mm. sort of allows them to sort of see you know, as i say there wasn't anything when it happened to me so knowing nice. that that when somebody is in that situation they're able to find the information and find that somebody else has come through it yeah, and out the other side yeah yeah you know, that's the thing isn't it? it's out the other side which is where I am and I am now I'm kind of almost out the other side um but yeah I just wanted to take this opportunity thank you so much oh, thank you thank you thank you so much I'll go back <laughs> off now bye <laughs> thank you Jane thank you uh actually when I was when I was living in Canada I worked um as a counsellor at uh, Women's uh, Refuge and Mary's book The Beginnerist it happened to have been donated um to us so which is where I first uh, came across yeah. it uh and then handed it um, in fact I think we bought several copies for women who were coming into the shelter not necessarily because they were experiencing that same but it was actually the the telling of the story and I think it, uh, you know somebody's talked about that sort of writing the story as, as therapy being able to yeah. to put those thoughts down really really valuable really really helpful definitely um mary there was quite a gap between you writing the bigamist and then writing the psychopath yeah how, how was that that gap um that was well i mean i always meant to write a follow-up at some point um because i always knew when he came out of jail because he was he got uh, five years in jail so he did two and a half and then was deported back to the usa in 2009 um but you know so i always knew there was going to be another phase <laughs> You know I mean, there's going to be new victims, which there were. Um, and, you know, so I, I always kind of thought I would do a follow up at some point, but I just didn't know when. Um, but I was actually contacted in 2019 by um, because, um, sorry, the book I had the Random House had the bigamist for 10 years. And then in uh, sort of 20, 2007 to 2017, and then they they basically told me it was out of print. So I got the rights back and I republished it myself in 2017. So it was three years I had it self-published. And then I was targeted by uh, Little A Publishing, which is the, the traditional publishing arm of Amazon. So they actually said they wanted to commission me to write The Psychopath. So it was that kind of like, I, I kind of always wanted to do it and I'd been gathering information, but I, you know, it was, it was that kind of push that, that the publishers actually asked me to do it. That was great. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, otherwise I'd probably still now be going, <laughs> I'm gathering information for it, you know, procrastination yeah. king. Yeah. You know. Okay. That happens to many. There are quite a few writers on here. I think we probably all can, yeah, we can all relate to the, <laughs> the procrastination. <laughs> okay. I actually remember somebody saying that the artists, you know, that one of the best things the the real key to artists is know when to stop. <laughs> yeah, we know when it's done. No yeah. it's done it's right. uh, and Mary, where can we find your books? Uh, Amazon bookshops, um, you know, sort of like, yeah, sort of Amazon's the, the easiest because it's actually published by Little A, so it's most available there. But if you're if you're not an Amazon fan, you can order it through any bookshop. So Brilliant. worldwide. Lovely. So. Thank you very much. OK. Does anybody have anything they want to say to either Mary or to Suzanne before we before we close down for the afternoon? I asked Mary a question quickly, sure, please. Um, I was just wondering what, uh, whether you chose the covers of your book specifically. No, I didn't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I did. I did the original. Um, I don't know. I've got the, the the that was the sort of this bookmark I've got. The original cover was was that image, um, and the when Little A took it over, they chose the covers the for the new version, um, and I I wasn't overly excited about them but I'm getting used to them now 
<laughs> but yeah, so like that they chose them because that's what works with the market. So no, but yeah, um, I do I do cover design and stuff for other people. So um, you know, I was always going to be a bit fussy about it. <laughs> But that's brilliant, the thing about, cover designer. But, brilliant yeah well i mean the trouble the trouble is with um when you're traditionally published you don't have a say you know you can you can say you know i don't like that or it's not keen on that but they just go oh all right okay bad luck yeah. <laughs> so all right well thank you so much suzanne and thank you again um, mary and thank you to everyone for joining us on this um righteous read um, there will be another event next month, which will be I'll be posting um, and uh, be two different writers. Uh, and in fact, there's two events next month. Um, Ian, do you want to say, say something about the other event, uh, Spoken Word in Alawa? You're on mute, Ian. You're still on mute. Oh, there you, there you go. go. <laughs> so no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't unmute. Sorry, I don't know what's happening. Um, what do you want me to say? Um, oh, do you want to just tell us about um, the uh, the Alawa event and that there's going to be a writers' read in Alawa? And Chris yeah, Tate, sure. Chris Tate, um, you're are you still with us? Chris Tate <laughs> is going to be taking part in that as well. Yes. As is as is Debbie. Debbie's also here with us. Yep. Yeah. Forgive me because I don't have. I was quickly trying to find the, the, the bump on paper because if I haven't got it in front of me, I never okay. remember a thing. Um, but if I just tell you, you can say the date because um, you'll remember which day it's on, I'm sure. But one weekend in Alloa, which is an online mini festival with writers reading spoken word, uh, creative writing, um, songwriting workshop, um, music definitely music lots of music some wonderful jazz and blues and god knows all what amazing stuff it is from thursday the 20th to sunday the 23rd of may that, yeah. and lisa thank you lisa is doing one of these writers read events as part of one weekend in Alloa. and this is the inaugural one weekend in Alloa. i've not done it before and it feels a bit weird because we won't actually be in Alloa. we'll be online but who cares? You know, nothing's where it should be right now. So I just thought, let's go for it. So you're all welcome to come to Alloa virtually um, <laughs> and get involved with One Weekend in Alloa. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, um, the spoke, there was one spoken word event and the clamour for spots at that event was such that I literally had to create a second one. So it was a part one and a part two and both are, are, are fully um, subscribed with spoken word performers, uh, which is wonderful, absolutely wonderful. You know, there's such a thirst and a hunger for it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you haven't been lucky enough to get one of those spots, please do come along nonetheless uh, and listen and watch and enjoy and support. Uh, and hopefully next time around, uh, we'll hear some of your amazing voices as one of the actual performers. So there we go. One Weekend in Alloa. You'll find us on Facebook, One Weekend in Alloa. We can't really go wrong. Thank you so much, Ian. Thank you. Thank well, you. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure everybody needs to go get get away and, and start doing dinner or get into the garden or pour that gin and tonic because now it's after five o'clock. We all can. <laughs> Except for uh, Philip, who's in America and it's still not there yet. <laughs> 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 so um, thank you all again for joining us. And uh, somebody said they were clipping their bushes. Right. Oh, <laughs> maybe that's too much information. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> but I look forward to seeing you at another Righteous Read uh, next month. And there, so there will be two in May. And in June, there's going to be a, a special extra one for children. So there'll be two children's ah. authors. And Molly, are you still with us, Molly? I think, Molly, you're going to be taking part in that, aren't you, with your children's books? So, yeah. So that's a time to bring some, for mums or grannies and granddads to bring their, their uh, little ones to the to the screen as well. OK. Bye-bye, right. everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.